everybody. There is so many crazy things going on in the world right now. It's, I mean, we can't even keep track. I was talking with a friend the other day and we talked about the fact that I had written an article on LinkedIn about the closing of South by Southwest. And today somebody left a comment disagreeing with what I said, which first of all, we weren't really disagreeing. Second of all, the post was written eight days ago. We live in an entirely different world. I mean, who would have thought that when we were talking last week about the possibilities of working from home, that this week, almost everybody would be trying to work remotely. And I got an email blast from a friend of mine. Her name is Jessica Pettit. She's joining us here today on this video call. And her uh, email was talking about what to do when you have to work remotely, when, when you're gonna work from home. And she had, I don't know, something like nine tips plus three bonus tips about what you have to do. And the whole article was great, but I especially was interested in the bonus tips. So I asked Jessica if she would jump on a Zoom call so that I could share this with all of you. So Jessica, how you doing? Uh, working remotely. <laughs> uh, that's not fair, because you and I have been working remotely for 10 and 20 years respectively. So we're a little bit used to being in our houses doing this, but for a lot of people, today was the first day that they really worked remotely. Well, what's interesting is I was trying to set it up to a play on words joke is that where we have worked remotely for 18 years, um, remotely working is very, very different because it's a very different world. I'm trying to be really conscious of my clients or my customers or my kind of followers or whatever that this is the first day that everyone is home from school that maybe wasn't normally home from school or partners are home or you're back like taking care of people or racing to get your own virtual content out there because of something that's been mandated by your job. So uh, working remotely and remotely working. And that time thing that you just mentioned are real. So the, the article you're referencing, I actually wrote last Thursday. Uh, so that would have been what the 15th, 14th, 13th, no 12th of March to be my April newsletter because by maybe April, early April, some of us may be working remotely because that's that was the thought, That's what you thought five days ago. That's what I thought on Thursday, right? So then today is Monday. So I'm like, all right, well, we're going to have to send that out um, because now here we are. Well, it's interesting because you talk about, uh, you know, people getting working from home. I think a lot of people were worried about, oh no, what if I have to do an occasional uh, conference call and my dog barks? But really, it's so much more than that. I was on a call earlier today. In fact, I've done like six Zoom calls today. And by the time we're recording this, it's almost four o'clock in the afternoon where I am. And I don't think I've done six Zoom calls in a single day ever in my life. But it's everybody who I communicate with is now suddenly remotely working and needs to have different types of, of contact. And I was on one call and I had the audio up. I wasn't wearing my my nifty headphones. And the person was talking about how hard it is for the spouse who usually works at home to suddenly have their partner in the house because they're used to having the whole place to themselves. And my wife shot me like that stink eye because even when I'm not traveling, I often work from Starbucks, mm -hmm. but now Starbucks is closing. So we're, we're all here. Our high school senior is here. Everybody's under one roof. And the only thing we don't have is, is a dog. So there's no barking. Yeah, well, I started the article off with the, the premise that like, oh, the dogs or the noise or how are we going to control for this? Or I was talking to another friend of ours about how when uh, she has twins and she's written a number of things about working from home with kids and like having a magic box of toys. So when she had like a conference call with a client, like that's the box that the kids could play with. New well, toys arrived for the small children. Right, except those kids are now home working from college, adult <laughs> freshman in college. And I was like, what's your fun conference call box of toys for 18 year olds? And she's like, uh, increased internet speed. I'm I like, was thinking, Heineken's. <laughs> hey, look, we've yeah. got a 12 pack. Stay away, mommy's yeah. on conference call. So I, I started the article off. I know we're talking about the end piece, but I started the article off again, five days ago, thinking this could be useful in a few weeks that the dog barking actually isn't the hardest part, in my opinion, of working from home, but it's providing the structure of what you're doing. And not this, if we're going to focus on the end piece, it's more about workplace culture and what you're actually going to take from this experience. But the productivity pieces is, is the dog barking isn't it. What actually happens, and we said this right before you hit record, is that 
as I write at the beginning of the article, I have a whole day planned. I have a structure. I have everything going. And the next thing I know, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. And I don't even know how that happened. Right. Well, and we decided to do this call an hour ago. So that blocked out, you know, our time on our calendars today that we right. didn't have blocked out an hour ago. And so, I was 23 minutes late because my partner is also now home and we had to have a conversation about when was the best time for him to go for a run. So before we get into that end piece that really struck me, those sort of three bonus tips, do you want to go over a couple of points that you had in the first part of that email? I mean, honestly, because it's Monday, March 16th, I think we have all been inundated with every company we have ever given our email address to with their remote working tips. So like... <laughs> Remembering to go outside um, where you have the entire space, you also need to have the focus space. Um, also get up, you know, like have some downtime. You can get very distracted by chores instead of doing other things. Um, as an extrovert, like don't ambush the UPS person because you haven't spoken to a, a living human. <laughs> so Zoom calls or actual conscious calling time, um, keeping track of time, you should probably eat lunch around lunch hmm. right i know that's my wife works from home and i know that is a thing often when i'm here late in the day around four o'clock she'll be like making a sandwich and i'm like what are you doing are we having dinner at seven or six thirty and she's like yes but i never ate lunch so you that's actually a very important tip i think yeah um one of the things that i gathered because you know i did research before i knew it was going to be like urgent um but one of the other things i thought was interesting was to be contemplative of your commute so even though like for my office, that is my bedroom and that is the living room in the kitchen, the commute, if I had been in office, the reason why that's important is that one, you need to prepare for coming here. So like people that I was interviewing, like they put on shoes and like put their wallets in their pockets as if they were going to work. So it's good for the mind. But then also when you are in the other part of the house and it's after dinner, it's very easy to pop back in here, but you need to treat it as if you're going to have to, do you need to drive to the office to do this? No. Great. Then go play with your family. So keeping that boundary. So thinking about your commute is important. Um, checking in and recognizing the difference And this led to some conversation too, but checking in with other people who are working remotely. So similar to a video call, it, it's a different experience. If some people are in person, some people are calling in and some people are videoing in. So one of the best things that is usually recommended is everybody does the same thing. So even if some of you are in the same space, everyone should video call in or so that way everyone, it's a normalizer, but you need to be checking in with those folks as well. And then the, That's a really good piece of advice that, that I have not heard that from other people. And I did wake up this morning to 50 inbound email newsletters that said how to work from home. My favorite was addressed, dear Tom, today is probably the first day you ever worked from home. And I chuckled because I've been working for myself for 11 years. It's like, no, they didn't do any research. It was a blanket email, but there were 50 such emails today. And uh, I never saw, of course, I didn't read them all, but I never saw that piece of advice that when doing conference calls or audio telecalls, everybody should do it the same way. That I like that equalizer piece. Yeah. And then the last two seem pretty basic, but I think are also, oh, you didn't think about that. And that is you don't have your IT department and you don't have your office supply closet. So what do you actually need from work? Um, and then make that list, buy those things, keep them stocked up, one, we don't know how long this is going to happen. And two, you're going to spend like, oh, I'm out of post-it notes, right? Like, do not go down the rabbit hole of what it takes to get new post-it notes to show up at your house when you need them because you're going to end up buying Crocs and we don't need any more Crocs. Um, and then the last thing is around the decor, uh, playlists, um, what kind of atmosphere you need in order to be productive. And for me, it really changes. So like if I'm writing, I need a playlist of songs I don't know any of the words to because otherwise I will sing. Um, when I am filing or kind of like reviewing articles or, you know, less intensive stuff, I need music. I only need the words to because it keeps me focused. I didn't know that until I started working from home. And then like just what you need around your office. Um, I also have my work coffee cup. So this one generally is when I am sitting at my desk in the morning and when I have lunch it goes in there to the kitchen 
I go and actually have lunch at my lo lovely little cafe called my kitchen. And then I come back with the afternoon drink. So this is a reminder, right? I haven't done that yet. Or I keep my dog leash. If I haven't gone on a dog walk yet, it's present in my office as a reminder of other things to do. So decor, music, and atmosphere is the last one of the 10. But then bonus round. I thought the bonus round really was relevant because it gets into this whole idea of sort of what's going on behind the scenes of your office culture. And it also ties into something that I've been talking a lot about. And that is how do we, how do we stay in touch with these people? Because with this, all this talk and every time you turn on CNN or any of the, the news things, the big word right now is social distancing. And I understand, I think it's important. And the joke was for several days, oh, introverts across the world are celebrating. Mm -hmm. However, this isn't an introvert extrovert thing. Humans still need to have interaction. And there's a difference between being an introvert and choosing some solitude time and actually being lonely and feeling disconnected. Those are two entirely different things. And, and, and feeling lonely and disconnected happens to introverts and extroverts, especially when you insert it into this whole work culture. So you had three points and I'm gonna do this just from memory. I think one was communication, another was transparency, and another one was about space. And so why don't we talk about those? Sure, well, and I think that Tom, you brought up a really great point in one of your recent posts that the, the bridge of understanding workplace culture, right? Is that if, if now we're all talking about social distancing and what that means, your concept of social tightening is a really key thing to understand that I think if we bring it into a workplace culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of lens is that there is stuff that has been happening in your workplace that is going to show up now because of this difference in a way. So when you're talking about people feeling lonely or disconnected or that they don't belong, uh, power dynamics around uh, bullying or hazing that is present in the physical office space, that is, it's still going to manifest itself, but it's going to manifest itself in a way that is not something you're used to because of everyone working remotely now. So then your job as a manager or a supervisor, I think combined with your concept of social tightening is noticing what are people's needs? What are people needing to do? You know, the bully in the office always gets the good coffee mug. Well, how are they going to maintain their feeling of being the bully if they can't physically take an actual artifact in the office away from someone? They're going to figure out how to do that remotely, hmm. right? Or their insecurities are going to come out in a different way. So I came up with three kind of elements that need to be thought of because they're going to show up differently. But you can, as a supervisor, manager, leader, et cetera, um, I'm saving you a copay. I'm saving you a consulting fee, right? <laughs> but if you start noticing what's happening, it's you can diagnose the problem when you all come back together. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I definitely, you know, I'm, I'm really big into this idea of while we have to be away from our normal social activities. And for some people, if you know, you're an extrovert, you like to go to the parties, you go to all the networking events, that's great. But if you're an introvert, maybe you have a favorite coffee shop that you like to go to and sit. And while you don't talk to anybody, you're still having that interaction with there are humans within the proximity of you. Well, now Starbucks is closed. So you're at home all alone. And so we have to be, uh, what's the word? We have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. And we have to actually put our attention on how do we make sure that we stay in touch with those people who matter? And some of those are family, some are friends, some are coworkers, some are clients. Uh, some might be just other people we ancillary run across. And the fact is, is that we have to do this. I call it tightening. So it's like taking a screwdriver. You know, it's lefty is loosey, but tighty is righty is tighty. We have to make sure every day we're tightening that screw a little bit or after a week, a month, God forbid, three months of this goes on, our social fabric is going to disappear. So, so I think it's really important. And, and I think just focusing on sort of that workplace culture that we're going to talk about right now, I think that matters. Mm -hmm. Well, in the first piece around this communication, right, is I'm not adding to anybody else's stress, like in the middle of trying not to be a victim of a pandemic, also fix your workplace culture. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I am saying is, is that you can notice what happens. What do you notice is the same? What do you notice is different? And then when this calms down, then you can work on it prior to the next crisis, right? So mm -hmm. The, the piece around communication is that there are people currently who feel left out. So now when they are re remote, how, are the, how is the feeling of left out 
going to get changed when they are spread out. There are people who do not feel left out right now who will now feel left out because of the dynamics of the office shifting. So again, you don't have to solve it in the middle of COVID-19, but as a supervisor, manager, leader, things like this, is you need to be able to notice that when, when something happens, so we, I use this example a second ago. So let's say that Tom and I are in a meeting at nine o'clock in the morning. It does not go well. Tom is a douchebag. I don't know why I have to work on him with this <laughs> dumb, right? Okay, so then I bitch about that after the meeting, right? So maybe it's like 10, 30, 11 o'clock, I have a different meeting, different topic. 12 o'clock, I go to lunch. I'm still kind of irritated at Tom, but all right, fine. I come back, 1.30, we have a completely different topic meeting, but Tom is also in that meeting and he's stellar and he's super good and he's like not doing anything that registers as douchebaggery. In one workday, I have been able to edit the story that I've had about my relationship with my coworker, Tom. When you work remotely, I don't necessarily have the stimulus to change the story that I've written in my head. Mm. And by not having the stimulus to edit the story I have in my head, it's just going to become more real. It's going to fester. Right. And that's good and that's bad, but it's not real. And so to your point, the social tightening is that we don't actually know how long this is going to go on, not to like add to the panic, but let's pretend it's three months, right? Who knows? Five days from now, we're going to be like three months. It's, it's over. Who knows? So, <laughs> But let's say it's three months. How are you maintaining the social tightening needed to have the impetus to leave room for edits for the stories that we are writing in our own heads to feel safe and prepared and like we can do our job in the middle of a crisis, even though all this cray is happening in my house. How can I do that so that when we come back together, we actually come back together better for this experience, not worse for this experience. And it's from this standpoint, really noticing what's happening with the communication dynamics. That's number one bonus tip. Nice. Well, and I think that that is important. Part of, I, I don't think about this naturally, that part of communication is taking time to think about what do I need to do to communicate? Because I think sometimes, you know, being who I am, I, I sort of just, something happens and I communicate. And so your mm -hmm. point well, is taking that. I have job security. Time. I'm sorry for interrupting you. That's right. I, I have job security because people have not done the work needed to have difficult conversations, mm. right? So this is also another difficult conversation, but it's coming on the tails of the history of diversity, or uh, no pun intended, uh, Freudian slip, the, the, the tails of the, the lack of training of having really challenging conversations when things weren't challenging. Mm -hmm. So like you saying like, well, I haven't really thought about it. Well, we haven't really needed to think about it, except of course we have needed to think about it, but we haven't. So then now what can we actually do so that that gets better before the next crisis? Well, and going back to my whole concept of social tightening, communication is what it's all about. I mean, that's, that's the thing is, is that if, if we allow ourselves not to be communicating, then we're going to have bigger problems when eventually this ends and it will eventually end eventually we will be back in the office and we will be doing things now will it look the same i don't know i think a lot of industries are gonna are gonna change because of what's gonna happen especially mm -hmm. the longer this goes on however if we're not communicating with the people in our lives and in the course of our conversation now i mean our coworkers and the people involved in our company if we're not really being purposeful with that communication mm -hmm. then it may not change for the better well, and interesting transition to bonus tip number two is that not communicating still is communicating. I'm going to write a story mm -hmm. to feel safe and prepared, whether you are participating or not. So then the idea of kind of bonus tip number two is this increased need of communication to the point of potential oversharing is going to help with the idea of what transparency means. So you have all these people spread out. So now the power dynamic is going to shift. Who has affirmation? Who is hoarding the resources? Who's getting copied on everything? Who's not getting copied on everything? Now I can write a story about micromanagement and maybe you are going to be micromanaging. I can also write a story that like, nobody's telling me nothing, right? Well, you just got left off an email, like <laughs> you're stressed out right now. Somewhere in between there is exactly what you're talking about is the intentionality of communication. So, 
from a supervisor manager point again, like send it again. Even if you think like, oh, they already know this. Like one of the biggest feedbacks I get when I'm doing workplace consulting is organizations are like, well, we sent an email, right? Well, they don't know that. And much like you at the top of this interview, you got 50 emails today of the same subject and you didn't read any of them, right? So oversharing. So I have a friend, I have a friend. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have a friend who worked in the early days of technology in and around email as something new that we were all adopting. And what he kept trying to remind all of his customers who were adopting email and they were like, yay, we now have email. We're worldwide webby. Was that you have to remember that email is a best intention communication tool. Just because I sent you an email doesn't mean you got it and doesn't mean you read it. And that's something I think we forget a lot. Right. Well, and there's all the, I mean, we can talk about generational things too, right? So like as a classic Gen Xer, my inbox is my to-do list. And then I can talk to somebody else who doesn't even check email, right? So the intentionality is probably leaning more towards oversharing, but also managing your own micromanagement tendencies. Same, same, right? The other one is intentionally setting up regular one-on-one -on -one meetings, regular staff meetings, regular check-ins, whether they're friends, family, or coworkers. I just wanna say that I think it's so important that we really do get focused on what are we trying to do to make sure we're not letting these other people slip through and our relationships die. So I think we have to be intentional in, in what we're doing, scheduling those meetings. But I was gonna ask you a question around transparency right when we lost the internet, and that is how much of this transparency also goes with being willing to be vulnerable? Well, I would say a large piece of it, except we don't like talking about vulnerability. Unless Brene work. Brown was on the call, then we'd talk about it all day. I know. I could put on a denim shirt. Um, but what is interesting is that talking about vulnerability and leadership, I think, comes up. But talking about vulnerability inside internal work dynamics, you don't necessarily feel empowered enough to be vulnerable inside of workplace culture, right? So that's the other reason why this intentional communication stuff is really important because the transparency of, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this is also really important. So like one of my clients, for example, uh, I'm working with her community groups. They're just starting community groups internally. And so when I talk, one of the things they use, uh, um, Microsoft Teams, I was just debating whether or not I should name it. So another client I use uses Slack, they use Teams, I had to learn both of them, I'm not a techie person. So the feedback I'm getting from these community group leaders is that the tech, even though they're a tech company, Microsoft Teams is cumbersome and it's hard and it doesn't have the bandwidth for everything they're doing and they're still learning it. So I made several references and jokes in one of our last calls about how I'd watch nine hours of YouTube about Microsoft Teams, which by the way, riveting content on YouTube. Um, so then our, our follow-up call, she said, you know, I really need you to be like this confident voice because we need people to get on board about Microsoft Teams. And I said, I need you to understand I am a confident voice, but it takes vulnerability to know I also, the expert here, am having a hard time learning Teams, but we can do that part together so this part is the struggle, but this is what you are doing really well. And this is where my area of uh, expertise is. I can have both of those. And what she was saying was that my like vulnerability or transparency about not knowing how to use this thing was impairing my expertise in this area. So then I said, well, either first off, I disagree that that's true, but let's pretend it is. Don't ask me any more questions about this then, because now, you know, I'm not good at this. I'm not, I should not be fielding the tech questions about Microsoft Teams inside of a tech company, right? Like that's really your job. That's, I'm not, why, that's not why you hired Jessica Pettit's brilliance. Nobody hired me for tech support. That's, <laughs> that is true. But when, when you're being really strategic, so then, you know, I also am going to be working from home for the foreseeable future. So one of the first things I did was create a structured calendar for myself so that each day I know who is my, which client of mine is going to be my main focus today so that I'm doing a touch point once a week. Maybe I'm sharing a resource or an article or something like that, because otherwise I'm either going to get overwhelmed at all of the silence or I'm going to forget about them. 
<laughs> right? So I can't forget about them and I don't want to get overwhelmed and I want to be of service. So, and those are with clients I'm under contract with. So then now the real vulnerability is what am I doing outbound? How am I getting new people, whatever? And um, I think, and you probably would agree with me on this, the best thing we can do is serve the people that we are currently in relationship with. And we need to be intentional about that and transparently and vulnerably share what is going on right now. We are in a massive pandemic that is new to every single person. This is a great equalizer. So what are we doing? And I, I do agree that it's the people right now who we know. And that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about tightening. We, mm -hmm. You can't tighten with someone you don't know. This is not, I've been teaching networking skills and how to get the most out of being at a live event so that you can make a connection that could lead to a relationship that brings you to a new job or a new business opportunity or, or a merger and acquisition. Mm -hmm. But we're not making new connections right now. For the next several months, at best, all we can do is keep relationships going. Maybe we can even tighten some of those. But part of the way we have to do that is, is that we have to be, do that intentional piece. And here's the thing. It means that we have to reach out and say, how are you? And then we have to do something that's hard for a lot of people. We have to actually talk, care. We have to care. We have to listen to their answer. And then finally, not settle for fine. We have a thing in our society where you ask somebody, how are you doing? They go, I'm fine. Well, no. If somebody's fine, that's not enough. We have to, for this whole idea around social tightening is we have to get past fine. It either has to be, you know, I'm handling this well because, or I'm not handling this well because right. fine, fine is BS right now. And I think that if you really want to strengthen relationships, it means you're going to have to ask questions, you're going to have to communicate, and you're going to have to put yourself aside for some of these conversations. And a lot of us have been taught in business to flick a switch and deliver an elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that, this, it's a, a, an important ad is this is not an introvert extrovert thing. Exactly. Because like you said, there is a difference between solitude and loneliness. And what I thought was fascinating was Friday was the 13th was the first remote working day for a lot of people on my Facebook feed. I live on the West Coast. So I woke up at like, let's say seven, right? So that's 10 o'clock East Coast time. And my Facebook feed was like, oh my God, it's been an hour and a half. I'm already bored. So there's boredom management and there's social tightening and there's leadership and mm -hmm. all three of those you're going to need to be really honest about, you know, and present. But the thing that I think is interesting, which is also an interesting transition to number three is that one of the things that I'm doing now is I'm watching webinars on everything, but I'm also, you mentioned being on six zoom calls, but they're just having, I'm starting on Thursday, I'm going to do a three hour office thing where we're not talking to each other, but we're just physically present with one another so that we can get work done. Um, mm -hmm. Joking as speakers every 20 minutes or so, we'll just applaud each other so that our Anybody. egos will be Yes, good job, good job. You did it. Let's do it again. But I think that what is key too is that you, even though we're being told we're not allowed to touch each other, that there is a possibility that we will make an impact on each other without touching one another. And it's because we will actually notice and pay attention to what's going on. Now, it is important to mention neither of us are lawyers, neither of us work in HR. And a lot of these things, I think, have become workplace culture go-tos that you'd leave, leave all that in the parking lot. But you never actually left all that in the parking lot. You pretended that you did, you know? So... People know that you're in a rough marriage or having problems with your kids or you're an alcoholic or they know these things about you and they're going to wonder how that's going now that you're back at home and you can't escape, right? Um, the, the piece that is my bonus tip number three is that there are people who will feel left out and forgotten because they weren't CC'd on an email. Mm -hmm. There are people who will recognize that it's just as easy to message your boss's boss's boss on accident or on purpose. So some of that like workplace hierarchy, like you literally do not have to take an elevator up to go talk to somebody if you are mainly communicating on Gchat or Slack during this remote working. So people are gonna become more accessible and people may feel left out more. So the other piece that's important as a leader or the supervisor, manager, et cetera, is to really notice why were those power dynamics there in the first place? 
what does it feel like when your job is protecting everyone below you or like I remember once I got a letter of insubordination in my file because I had lunch with another new hire who was also from Texas. Um, we both got hired in the same week. She was like three levels above me, but we were both from Texas. So I invited her to lunch and I got in trouble because I wasn't allowed to meet with people out of my rank without approval. Why? Right. And there could be good reason. I'm not saying that there's not always a good reason. But most of us don't know that answer, and it's going to become very apparent any second now why those things exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you talk about sort of holding that space and that you're getting together with some people and doing working via just being logged on together on Zoom or whatever it is so that you're not in the same room, but you actually have other humans that you know are somehow there. Uh, the other thing is, and you're part of this, back in December, I started a, a thing for solopreneurs because I realized it gets lonely uh, when you work by yourself. And when I used to be in sales, I had a sales manager who we would just talk about sales. So I don't have a sales call anymore. So I started a thing called my sales call so that solopreneurs could get together and just talk. Well, all of a sudden, everyone who was on the call today reached out to me and said, this group is more important today than it was a week ago. So the people who've joined to be part of my sales call suddenly are like, we have a place like that I can come to. Because for some of the people on the call, they don't have nine social circles. So they're like, wow, I felt like I had a place today to talk about the problems I'm facing. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing with social tightening is we need to make sure that everyone has access at least somewhere to a place, even if it's virtually, even if it's logging on to you know happy hour at five o'clock where you just log on and everybody brings their own drink to their office and gets on a Zoom call and you can just see each other as you have your glass of wine or your coffee or your water we're going to need to find ways to hold space mm -hmm. with other humans. Yeah. We can't call it the third place because Starbucks did no, that would, totally Starbucks. copyright that. But I think, I think that is a really excellent idea is they're closed, but all those people need somebody, right? So you're going to have to figure out how to make your caramel macchiato extra pump skim drink. But then I will gladly meet up with you and we can make a plan for the next day. We can review what happened this day. We can just like, Talk, don't talk sports. Let's not talk sports. Um, but we can do whatever whatever we need to do. I think that sounds great because it is the it is the concept of social tightening that can't get lost in the leadership and the camaraderie and the community that could easily, by definition, feel secondary when we talk about social isolation. Right, and all all of this people working from home or splitting up three days a week. Who goes into the office? It's going to change the culture and the dynamic. And when we come back, it's not going to be the same. I think there are going to be changes to everyone's industries that we're not even predicting yet. Yeah. I mean, it's possible. It's also really obvious. We are super good about going back to like, well, I guess we'll just survive that. That was interesting. Let's just go back to normal now. So someone, we have an Someone's going to be selling t-shirts as soon as the virus is gone. Someone's going to be selling t-shirts saying, I survived COVID-19 2020. Right. Well, and I mean, not to be pessimistic, but like depending on, depending on what we determine is actually important to us, we'll determine on whether or not we go back to the old normal or we redefine normal. Nice. Well, I really believe that we need to choose people. We need to decide that through this, I mean, this is a health crisis. There will be people who, who won't survive and we can't make light of that. But I think that we also have to realize that in this world, it's choosing people. It's those connections that we have. Uh, there was a famous professional speaker 20 years ago. He's since passed away called Charlie Tremendous Jones. And his line was, you're the same person 20 years from now, except for the books you read and the people you meet. And mm -hmm. for some reason, that always hang, hung true with me. And now I think it's the books you read, the podcasts you listen to, and the people you meet. Yeah, that's true. Well, um, Jessica, thank you for coming on and sharing this. When I read your newsletter, I knew this was more than just forwarding it out to people. I knew we had to get you onto this video to talk about it because I think a lot of people, I think their cultures are going to get kicked in the teeth a little bit and they're going to have to navigate it. And I think you had some really smart things to say. Well, thank you, everyone. Tom Singer just complimented me. Someone alert the media. Uh, we will talk soon, hopefully, at the next uh, Social Tightening Happy Hour. There you go. That's right. Monday's at 5 o'clock on my Zoom room. All right. Dun -dun -dun. Thank you very much.